When you wake up on a normal weekday, what's the first thing on your mind? Is it to brush your teeth or to scroll through your newsfeed or emails? I bet at the top of the list, your priority is like most of the rest of the world, to get the kettle going. You see, something that unites all of us around the world is the fact that people seem to have found a staple drink they brew or steep to get them started for the day. It's that drink they keep coming back to sip. The most obvious or popular drinks of this kind are coffee and tea. As staples in our diets, these drinks keep us running. We rely on them for work, we orchestrate social occasions around them as social lubricants, and more importantly, many of us simply depend on them to keep awake. The property behind this, of course, is the world's most abused psychoactive drug, caffeine, which is found in both coffee and tea. But there are more plants out there that have caffeine than just coffee or tea. In fact, when you think about it, much of the world was not drinking coffee or tea until the last few centuries, or even in the last hundred years. And that is very much related to a history of colonialism, new modes of transportation, and plantation economies popping up. Perhaps we've gone down a path dependency with these two drinks and overlooked the dozens of other different species that could offer us a very similar staple comfort of a hot cup of brewed goodness in the morning. I've long been interested in ethnobotany, so I thought I'd investigate the subject. When I dug deeper, I found a diverse history where all sorts of wonderful drinks were used and abused to keep our forebears awake. So here's what I found. First, let's take a look at the drink that is making the most headway into the mainstream as an alternative to coffee and tea. Ilex paraguariensis, or yerba mate. Yerba mate is a South American holly plant that was widely appreciated by peoples in the southern Andes and Pampas before being picked up by Europeans. Steeped in just water, the dried and cured plant takes on a tobacco and earthy taste. In Argentina, Uruguay, Southern Brazil, and Paraguay, where the drink is popular, it is traditionally prepared in gourds and drunk with straws known as bombillas. Like tea and coffee, there's plenty of information out there on yerba mate. But what should be noted is that mass cultivation methods for the plant were devised twice. Once during the time of the Jesuit reductions in the Pampas, and a second time only in the last century. More interesting to note is that this drink was brought back to the Levant during a back migration of people who had gone to Argentina in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Where I am in Vancouver, the go-to place to pick up yerba mate tends to be Middle Eastern shops, who carry it for Syrian, Palestinian, and Lebanese clientele just as much for South Americans. Another good contender to tea and coffee is cacao, the Obroma cacao, commonly consumed as hot cocoa in the West. Though it is now more often associated with candy and chocolate bars, in the first few centuries of European colonization of the Americas, a beverage more similar to drinking chocolate than hot cocoa was the drink of choice in Western Europe instead of tea and coffee. More importantly, it was valued by Mesoamerican cultures as a staple foodstuff and drink, so much so that cacao beans also functioned as currency. Ironically, the word chocolate used to refer more to the beverage than the solid bar in the early modern period. It was drunk by European aristocrats with cream and sugar like tea. Another South American plant that has become industrially cultivated is guarana, or Polinia cupana. Guarana is a tropical climbing plant. Both the fruit and seed contain caffeine, but the seed of guarana possesses up to four times the amount of caffeine as the average coffee bean. Its taste is earthy or woody and subtly nutty, and has a bit of a herbal and bitter flavor. With honey, I find it quite palatable. Outside of Brazil and South America, however, guarana still remains relatively unknown, even though it is now one of the most used ingredients for soda in that part of the world. Oddly enough, it is slightly popular in the Balkans, particularly in Serbia. In general though, it does seem Korana is enjoying wide-scale interest by beverage producers who see the fleshy fruit as a good source for producing sugary caffeinated energy drinks. An ingredient that used to have a similar potential as Korana is the kola nut, which can either refer to kola netita or kola acumenita. Distantly related to cacao, the kola nut flies under the radar in the etymology of the world's most popular soda beverage, Coca-Cola. This plant is the namesake of cola beverages, though ironically, there's no modern connection between the beverage and the plant. Just as coca leaves were abandoned in the recipe, most cola drinks out there no longer contain any traces of the cola nut. Cola can also be consumed like a steep drink, however, similar to tea or coffee. In the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica, people brew a drink with the crushed nuts called bisi. They consume it with milk or spice it with nutmeg, almost like masala chai. It seems this tradition is an evolution of the practice of chewing the nut for energy in West Africa, where the plant is native. Historically, kola nut was one of the main commodities of trade between the tropical parts of West Africa and the Sahel, and even beyond across the Sahara, competing with other prized goods like salt and gold for space on caravans. Moving to the lower Mississippi basin, we come across a historically important plant known as yopon or Ilex vomitoria. 
As the name suggests, this drink was connected with the practice of ritual purification through induced vomiting, something many of the southern nations of the eastern woodlands practiced. Now, it seems large quantities of any caffeinated drink might have a similar effect, so it should be noted that when consumed like any other daily steep, yaupon is quite benign and even also quite tasty. It has a malty and brown sugar flavor that could easily substitute for tea and is particularly good in the iced tea form. In colonial times, the brew made from yaupon was also known as the black drink, as well as casina, which can also specifically refer to one of the two related species used to produce the drink. I find it interesting that though the species is also holly, related to yerba mate, it has its own distinct taste. Part of it may be to do with the curing and processing methods used. If you're curious to try this drink though, there are companies trying to bring it back as a thing, such as Cat Spring Yaupon in Texas. Another marginally consumed holly for its caffeine is guayusa, or Ilex guayusa, which is kind of like an in-between of Yaupon and Yerba Mate. Native to the northwestern parts of the Amazon and the cloud forests of Ecuador and northern Peru, this plant also has a rich indigenous history, but was not as favored by European settlers as much as Yerba Mate was during colonial times. Guayusa has a herbal and grassy flavor with some coconut sugar notes, kind of like Yaupon. I find it interesting as an alternative to tea, but it seems the plant is more successful in the market being used for energy drinks, similar to Guarano. Now, I do find it curious that one of the most common kinds of plants to yield caffeine are hollies. For example, there's an even more obscure edible holly species known as kuding, which is supposedly consumed in rural parts of southern China. I have been able to source kuding in Vancouver, but I haven't been able to discern if it is from the holly or another plant that goes by the same name, which is Ligustrum robustrum, and which doesn't have caffeine. Finally, the most obscure but potentially potent caffeinated plant out there is this liana or woody vine native to the Amazon, known as Yoko, or Paulinia Yoko. Though it was written about by the famed Richard Evan Schultes and also brought to somewhat more public attention by Wade Davis, the plant still remains relatively obscure and is the only plant here that I haven't been able to consume yet. To consume the liana as a beverage, branches are cut into small stems and soaked in water and then wrung over a bowl to extract the white or brownish sap inside, kind of like kava in Polynesia. This sap is supposed to have the highest concentration of naturally occurring caffeine. Indigenous peoples of the northern Amazon drink this cloudy sap water cold in the morning, and it is said they need nothing else to carry them forward into the day's work. Now, there are other drinks that seem to function in a similar way as the caffeinated drinks that I've gone over. Apart from coffee substitutes like chicory root, there are other plants that are savored for their own unique tastes, mildly stimulating properties, and ethnobotanical value. But these plants just don't contain caffeine. In South Africa, there is rooibos, or Aspalathus linearis, which has proven to be hard to domesticate. Although a cold shot of non-caffeinated rooibos espresso, sometimes known as red espresso, is becoming popular in some coffee shops. From the same neck of the woods, there is also honeybush, or various species from the Cyclopea genus. In the boggy boreal parts of Canada, the Pacific Northwest, and Scandinavia, there is Labrador tea, or Hudson Bay tea, steeped with rhododendron crinlanicum, and a couple other related species. And finally, in California, there's a tree that is distantly related to avocado and which produces a nut that is said to taste somewhere between coffee, chocolate, and toasty popcorn. That tree is known as the Californian bay myrtle, Oregon myrtle, pepperwood, spice bush, or umbellularia californica. And it also gets its fame from being the source of one of the only wooden forms of coinage, known as myrtle wood money. Okay, so after that survey of alternate forms of caffeinated beverages or similar kinds of beverages, what I'll now call steeps, I want to invite you to think of an alternate reality where all of these drinks are more popular because having more options to dabble in is always just more fun. That's what I did with this fictional map. Here you can see a legend and introduction to some of the major steeps or staple daytime non-alcoholic beverages featured on the map. In these blurbs, you can read up on some of the more fun ways to prepare the drinks, such as making that spiced cola nut or bissy drink that I alluded to earlier. For those unfamiliar with my work, this map is from Atlas Altera, a map-based creative project that explores a paracosm or an alternate world that is paradoxically similar to ours while also being radically different. It's a world where difference flourishes. Over the years, the project has been my method to apply my learnings or to creatively pin or keep track of interesting things I've learned in the fields of human geography, anthropology, and linguistics. Atlas Altair is also a thought exercise to spoof creeping homogenization and globalization. The point of Atlas Altair is to tell facts about our world through geographic lies, kind of like a shift in map projections, because sometimes it's hard to see the marginal for what it is without looking away from the established, without peeling off the dog. 
Now, if you're like me and you love coffee, but also think it'd be cool to change things up a bit and try other homey brews or stimulating steeps, you should pay attention to the fact that more and more of the rest of the world is all coming to converge on the same kind of habits and food ways. Not only are people from diverse cultural backgrounds all honing down on the same staple foods, we're all starting to consume the same crop cultivars, and that can have substantial ecological and economic ramifications. And that's not to mention the losses in flavor. But I'm also not trying to say we should prepare the lineup of plants I talked about today as a checklist or roadmap for appropriation as the next big international food trends, but rather to be aware of how mass culture and habits are enveloping the rest of the globe. So what can you do? Well, going for slow foods, eating local, and showing your interest as a buyer of heirloom crops can be a start. And I guess so is daydreaming about an alternate world that is not ruled by just coffee and tea. If you're still curious to learn more about all the other possibilities that are mapped out in Atlas Altera, go to the website atlasaltera.com and subscribe to the channel for more possibilities. Because after all, it's important to imagine counterfactuals where all sorts of difference flourish.